Welcome to Sustainable Farming Association's 31st Annual Conference. My name is Jerry Ford and I am the Network Coordinator for SFA. Uh, we were going to have uh, Liz Morris Otto do this welcome, but uh, she's lambing this morning. Uh, so this session is a conversation with Alan Giebert. We'd like to thank the sponsor of this session, the Minnesota Farmers Union, who protect and enhance the economic interests and quality of life of family farmers, ranchers, and rural residents. We'd like to remind you that one of our other winter events, the Midwest Soil Health Summit, is coming up March 9 through 11. We'll be featuring Gabe Brown, Sarah Keogh, and a panel of Minnesota soil health practitioners. You can learn more at our website, sfa-mn.org. And if you're not already a member, I would encourage you to join SFA to support this important work and stay connected to this community. Again, look for the membership link on our website at sfa-mn.org. I'd also like to let our viewers know that if you have your camera on and if your image comes up on the screen while we're recording, and yes, we are recording this, so you'll be able to come back to it later, uh, then you're in effect giving us permission to use your image in that recording. So if you don't want that, then just leave your camera turned off. Now you've read uh, uh, Mr. Giebert's award-winning column, The Farm and Food File in The Land Magazine and over 60 newspapers. I see them in The Land Magazine here in Minnesota and I follow Alan on Twitter. He's also the author of a delightful and insightful mem memoir, The Land of Milk and Uncle Honey. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much, Jerry. Well, we're just, we don't have a whole lot of time for this session, so I'm just going to dive right into some, uh, some questions that I personally would like to have answered. Uh, and we will do our best to include some questions from our, uh, our participants as well. If you'd like to folks put your questions in the uh, chat, you can also comment. Um, and so you wrote a piece, Alan back in December, well, I think it was the 18th, referring to the conditions in the late 1990s. And you said that uh, that era's low profit hog, cattle and dairy sectors were slow, easy targets for packers and processors who unchecked by government were integrating producers, quote unquote, uh, previously known as farmers into their supply chains through contracts that ensured supplies at cap prices. Long quote there, I apologize. Uh, that sentence is laden with truth about the meat industry and how it impacted, still impacts, farmers. What struck me personally is like, I finally found a kindred spirit as a farmer being called a producer gets my hackles up. Could you say more about that and about the meat packing situation that we're in at this point? Sure, I'd be delighted. The, um, you know, the word producer has always been a pet peeve of mine, and I have a whole farm of pet peeves, a whole herd of them. But uh, producer doesn't say anything. You know, what, what, what is a producer? Well, you don't know, unless it's, uh, you know, there's some explanation. It's generic. It's, it's I think it's demeaning. It's uh, depersonalizing, that's for sure. Um, uh, and it, it implies that you're part of this great machine and, and not a very important part. You're just the producer side. Uh, you don't have any other role than to produce. And this all came into fashion, you know, in the 1970s. And I, went, I was in college at the time and um, I remember almost every ag econ uh, economist that taught me or even agronomy uh, professors, they always talk to you and they always said boys because you were it was all boys of course and they would say um, this is this ain't your dad's agriculture this is a business it's no longer a way of life and how many times have you heard that growing up you know 30 40 50 years ago and you know what we did we made it that we made it into a business and now, and, and then our farm group started reflecting that business and we all turned into producers of what? Basically raw materials uh, that we weren't any different than a coal miner, 
you know, or a cab driver, you know, we didn't produce much value. And uh, that, that gave then ag business a leg up to where we are, where they, they, they then took us. And we just became part of it. The whole discussion about efficiency. Then all of a sudden we add other, other words that are meaningless, unless you're in a, you know, you're an industrial economist supply chain well when anybody says chain what does you think of i mean do you th i think of chains okay. and why would i want to be chained so i think language has to be very specific this is these are general terms they're depersonalizing be specific you know we say you, how many times do you hear now the word harvest when we really mean slaughter mm -hmm. well let's it's it's folks it's slaughtering it's not harvesting we're not harvesting things not harvesting wheat, we're, we're, you know, we're, be honest and be, be forthright uh, with whom you, you really want to buy your product. I mean, be proud to be a corn farmer, a hog farmer, a dairy farmer. I mean, tell people right up front what it is you do. They'll respect it. Right. Well, and for me, it takes out that element of, of caring for the land which is part of the being a farmer, of being part of this community, you know, if otherwise, and, and, and it, you know, Alan, I'm not going on some campaign to try to get everybody else to change the word, but in my little niche, <laughs> I just don't use it. Um, well, an, another word you'll never see in my column ever, ever, ever is consumer. I don't know what that means. We weren't put here to consume. We were put here for other purposes. We, and we do other things. We don't consume. We make choices when we buy food or clothes or a car. We don't consume anything. You know, I don't, so I don't know what consume means. It, it's again, it's a, it's not a very descriptive term unless you want to depersonalize it and make it into a process and, and, and cut out people. I, I just, the, the, the more we let that go on, the, the smaller and smaller we become in the equation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Well, we've used terms like eaters. Uh, I like eaters. Yeah, it's, it's a little, has a bit of an edge of humor to it, I think. But. Well, I'll, I'll, give, I, I'll tell you an old writer's trick is to take verbs like eat and change them into nouns. You know, all of a sudden, eaters, you know exactly what they do with one word, right. you know, instead of two or three. And yeah. so, you know, if you look, if you want to look for people who work on writing, look for that. Yeah. All right. Let's get a little bit political here. Uh, when oh, I'm, not, I'm not political at all. Yes, I, I've noticed that uh, um, with a sense of irony. Uh, when word first came out that then President-elect Biden intended to nominate Tom Vilsack for Agriculture Secretary, Reuters wrote that it was, quote, a choice expected to reassure commodity crop farmers but disappoint climate activists and small farm advocates. And then Friends of the Earth was a bit more blunt about it. I read a tweet from them that said, uh, we need a bold reformer at USDA, not a high paid dairy industry lobbyist who will do industrial agriculture's bidding. And that's quoting there that I didn't say that. Uh, now it appears that this has glided through Congress. Um, give us your take on Tom Vilsack and USDA. Well, I've, I've known Tom Vilsack for quite some time. I first met him in 1998 at an Iowa Farmers Union luncheon that I was the keynote speaker. And Tom Vilsack was just the add-on because he was a state senator in Iowa, one term, single term state senator in Iowa from and a former mayor, a little town of Mount Pleasant. He's got incredible pedigree, really. I mean, he was born an orphan in an orphanage. These Vilsacks family in, in Mount Pleasant, Iowa adopted him, he was born in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, they loved him to death, sent him to college, sent him to law school. Uh, he came back. He was a small town attorney there in Mount Pleasant. Uh, and then, I don't know, I am old enough to remember this quite clearly. I was already in journalism. In 19, in 1980s, 86, seems to stick in mind, 87, the local banker there in the height of the farm crisis, who was also the mayor, was some, a farmer walked in and murdered him. And Tom Vilsack stepped into the breach. 
and became you know leader in that community and leader and then be the mayor and then launched his political career. I sat across the table from him in this 1998 Iowa Farmers Union meeting and and uh, he got up to speak. He was introduced and um, uh, I looked. He had a young campaign aide with him and the campaign. I said, "Who's this guy?" And the campaign handed me some literature and explained all of that. But I didn't notice if he was a Democrat or a Republican. It didn't say on the literature. Oh. <laughs> so I asked the young aide, I said, what is he, a Republican or a Democrat? Oh, he said, he's a Democrat. And I said, I don't think so. I think he's a chicken because he won't announce what party he's running in. <laughs> and um, uh, so that was my introduction to Bill Sank. Then he, people forget he ran as a favorite son in Iowa in 2008 for president. He, well, he didn't back uh, Barack Obama. He backed Hillary Clinton once he dropped out in 2007. So, uh, but as secretary, he did exactly what Reuters uh, story explained. He really backed the big commodity groups. He's not a farmer or a farm advocate or even a farm person by, by trade or training. He's a lawyer. Uh, and a bureaucrat and a good one at that. But I, in print, when he was first named, I called him a, and I don't regret this. I called him a bank clerk who at the end of every day would balance the books. He just, you know, he was very good at that. Um, and then, and as he proceeded in 2008 through 2006, well, early 2017, he, he proved it. I mean, he's very good at balancing interests, but not very good at moving policy. And perhaps it wasn't his fault. Perhaps Barack Obama's administration didn't have good ag policy. They had good ag people at USDA. They really had some great people. But you know, they, they can't lead on their own. They need a leadership from the White House and maybe he just didn't get any. But now, he, now his, his spots have changed. He's publicly noted that he wants to emphasize climate change and, and work on that at the ag level. And the big thing is carbon sequestration. That in itself is an enormous topic. And that's one worthy of a seminar in and of itself. Does it work? Yes. Can it's possible? Yes. And I fear, however, that his, his new found uh, climate change religion will bulldog all of that, any common sense approach to carbon or, or the green uh, need. And we will get some really bad policy because of it. He's, he's, he's a pragmatic, what can I get done and get it done guy. He's not one guy to listen to, you know, what really is needed and necessary. So um, I, I, I worry about it quite a bit, you know, and I, I don't know, it's, I, I, is he the leader for the times? I, no, I don't think so. But will well, he get the job done? Yeah, he'll, he'll do that, he'll do the job. Mm -hmm. I, well, I guess the times will tell as we move forward. And you kind of touched on something else I was wanting to open up. Uh, I was back in January, you wrote about the likelihood that even with the substantial changeover in the House and Senate Ag Committees, which we have seen that, um, there wouldn't be much change in the kinds of policies that would be promulgated. You wrote, uh, new policies should be given space, however, to rise alongside the old to revitalize the weakening rural economy through regenerative, sustainable food production, rather than fund a deepening dependency on unsustainable ad hoc farm subsidies. Now the emphasis on regenerative and sustainable there was mine. Um, I, and of course you're speaking to an audience that uh, has a certain reverence for those words. Could you say more please? Well, uh... Just this week, I think that was proven even more true when the chairman of the House Ag Committee, uh, a Georgian, 20 years experience, named his subcommittee chairman. Now, nothing goes through the committee without coming through subcommittees. I think there's seven subcommittees in the House Ag Committee. Uh, and they then are the gatekeepers. They're the ones who bring policy ideas forward through the subcommittee hearings, then to the regular committee hearings, and then it goes to the House floor, if it makes it that far. Hmm. Well, two subcommittee chairmen are indicative of exactly what I said. One is Californian, um, uh, uh, Jim Costa. He's a full-time politician since college. He claims he's a dairy farmer. Uh, he hasn't milked any more cows than I have in the last 30 years, 40 <laughs> years maybe. Um, 
but he's chairman of the, of the livestock subcommittee, livestock and dairy subcommittee in, in the House Ag Committee. Where he's from in central, uh, the Central Valley in California, it's all 5,000 and 8,000 and 10,000 cow dairies. Mm -hmm. now, do, and, and if you look at the money he's taken over his career, he's taken a ton of money from livestock groups. And he's been in Congress since I think 2004. Is he going to change his spots and, and, and advocate for small time, small dairy, or you know, uh, not pour money in, into big uh, status quo programs in dairy? That would that would be a real revelation. That would be you know, an, an incredible story if he did. He's not going to do that. So I would not expect dairy policy to change. Even more importantly, the chairman of the of the subcommittee on. Um, uh, 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 risk management and, 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 and commodities mm -hmm. is Sherry Bustos. She's an Illinois, Western Illinois, tough district, big swing district, Western Illinois. But she has never failed to attend every county farm bureau meeting and convention there ever was. And she's a huge supporter of ethanol, an enormous backer of commodity programs, never voted against any additional uh, farm program benefit of accruing to to commodity producers. Hmm. So uh, I joked at the time with some friends in Illinois that when she was named, I said, they should just, they should just name the, either the president of the Iowa Farm Bureau or the president of the Illinois Farm Bureau to that committee because, and save her the phone call <laughs> because that's what's reflected in her background. So I am not at all hopeful that this ag committee will change anything I mean, you're gonna to have to do it at the grassroots level. You're gonna to have to go to those meetings, put those people on the spot. And if they don't show up, then you make a fuss about that. Why aren't you showing up? Who, what aren't, what aren't you doing? Let's get, even you know, local county, township, places like that, that's where you have to start all this because it's not, Washington DC is reactive. It's not proactive. Right. They're never gonna take up a new idea unless you bring the idea to them. And, uh, they just don't know. They're too busy doing other, uh, many other things. But one thing they are set to do there is to protect the status quo. And then, you know, Jim Hightower, the old Texas Ag Commission, always said status quo is Latin for the trouble we're in. And um, that's pretty true in ag policy. And think about it. Yep. Ag policy in the last 40 years now hasn't changed. And how much longer can this last gasp of this policy continue? especially when you pour something on the order of $46 billion extra federal money into it just last year alone. That's what, that's the gas needed to keep that balloon floating. Oh, geez. Uh, well, I, that was very nice to hear you mention Jim Hightower there. Um, I'm originally from Texas and met Mr. Hightower 30 years ago. Uh, so I, I, probably a lot of people aren't familiar with his work, but look him up. Well, I got um, I got fired one time from a job uh, before because I was told I wasn't I wasn't the guy who walked down the middle of the road, and all I came to mind was Jim Hightower's book. You know, the only thing in the middle of the road is uh, yellow lines and dead armadillos. That's right. <laughs> so I told the guy that, and he fired me again. So I thought. <laughs> uh, uh, it sounds like you've been fired by some of the best. Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, so you, you you're saying that there should be space for these new ideas to rise along with those uh, existing policies and the status quo. And is the way that we do, at, is that how we do it? Is by going there and getting in their face or there other means? Well, I think it's, yeah, there are other means. Um, if USDA is gonna give Big Ag $46 billion extra last year, why can't we have a law in the books that say for every dollar you give these commodity programs to keep them afloat? Why don't, we, why don't you give small ag, regenerative, sustainable efforts, efforts like what you have going on in Minnesota, Wisconsin, give us 20 cents of that, just mm. 20 cents. Or, you know, and start out, I'd start out at 30 cents in order to get 20, but get or 15 cents. Because everything you've done up until this point has been done on a shoestring and look what you've done. Look, I, I think that's an incredible example of, of how you've 
bootstrapped these needed and necessary and, 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 and wanted items in the stores into the people's minds about fresh food. And as I think one of your presenters said the other day, it's not about efficiency, it should be about resiliency. And if anything showed this spring is how unresilient, non-resilient our current food system is. If you wanna continue that charade until we end up with people's you know, in empty pantries, you be my guest. But people say, well, we have to feed the world. Nobody eats a plate of soybeans. Nobody eats a plate of, 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 of corn, field corn folks. They, you don't feed the world. And, and we say, well, we have the cheapest food supply in the world. We do not on, on, on a calorie by calorie basis because our diet is so sugar and fat heavy, two of the most expensive items you know, on the menu. We are not even close to being the cheapest food supply in America. We just hate, make a lot of money. You know, our income is so high that, you know, relatively speaking, the amount we spend on food is so low. Uh, I, I read an, a, a, an alarming statistic this week. It was Tyson's annual meeting this week and Tyson Foods just settled price fixing lawsuits out of court. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd been a, a, accused, allegedly accused of, of working in collusion with other packers to increase poultry prices and other red meat prices. So they settled out like what, hundreds of millions of dollars. We'll never know what the settlement was. But right. they bragged at their annual meeting that 81% of American households now use Tyson products each and every day, an increase of 11% over the past year. And because more people are cooking at home. Holy smokes, more people are cooking at home and more people are buying Tyson to cook at home. <laughs> That's really disturbing to me when there's yes. a, a great amount of local food to be had. But if you, I don't know what the organic market is nationally, they, people disagree on that number. Is mm -hmm. it 60 billion or 80 billion? I don't know. But whatever it is, you've done it on your own. You haven't done it with any help. Uh, not much anyway from the federal government or even local governments anymore. And moreover, if anything, I see the organic standards and that being lowered in order to allow the big boys in and, and, and bring their machinery and everything else in to compete. I just love the way you open up a whole nother big can of worms right there uh, with that last remark. Uh, so what I'd love to do is to see if we have, uh, if Katie would come in with us here. Katie is our kind of backstage manager and see if we have any questions or comments from our participants for Alan. Um, so far, no questions. There are um, a variety of comments on, um, let's see. Oh wait, Carl put in something here. Yeah, it's, it, so far it's mostly comments <laughs> riffing off of what you've, you've been talking about, so. Yeah. Well, in, uh, that sounds good to me because I have more questions. Let's do it. Uh, now I'm going to, in, and I get to ask mine. Um, I'm going to uh, encourage you folks, if you do have questions um, or comments that you would really like to direct at uh, Alan to comment that. Okay, Katie's got her hand up now. One just came in um, wondering from Sue, will Alan comment on the global situation of fertilizers, phosphorus in particular? Did you catch that, Alan? Yeah, I, I presume the, the comment is made in the, in the uh, spirit of collusion and monopoly and how uh, monopolized the fertilizer industry has become given the, uh, Russia has, you know, a large monopoly on phosphates. Cargill is the, you know, the American point uh, person here. They own almost all the phosphate mines there are in the United States, some in Canada. And then there's a conglomerate. So between the three, and it's mosaic, between the three, they have a, just a stranglehold on phosphate. And I'm not an agronomist, you know, I tried to avoid agronomy in college. I found it very hard, you know, 350 <laughs> soil types in Illinois. Come on, what am I supposed to do about that? Um, uh, but um, surely, Surely there's better ways to do it than what, you know, make a farmers dependent upon these monopolists who, you know, really drive uh, the cost structure in the fertilizer industry. 
it's not supply and demand it's what they want it's how they supply it and in your demand uh, you know functions as their their crowbar so if i have a single comment to say is this has been going on for a generation and that's a generation too long we don't see anybody willing to take on any antitrust efforts in 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 the in the united states or in congress and in fact what we've seen and this is a column part of the column that i wrote for next week was on the packers what we've seen is um, 40 years of not just inactivity, but actually uh, active participation on the part of the government to look at these, these examples of, of collusion and say, either bless them outright or make minor uh, uh, requests that they be altered, uh, you know, divested or here or there. It's just, they've, they bought into the whole Chicago school of economics that the market is sacred. And what we do know about the market is that it's not sacred. And in fact, it's one of the most impure places in the world. I didn't know that about the phosphate. I, Katie, do we have other questions at this point? Yeah, a few more have come in. Um, off of the previous question, do the antitrust laws have any teeth to address this? Packers, fertilizer, et cetera. Well, no, no, not yet. Uh, that you would you would assume that they would, but most antitrust laws swing on the concentration of uh, they call it the rule of three. How much do the big the biggest three players? How what percentage of the market do the biggest three hold and control? And there's an HHI index, and I can't tell you what it stands for, but it's it's um, two people who develop how you examine a, a segment, say seed corn sales. And if that comes, if the top three have 50% or 80% of the market, then it's time for antitrust to act or it can act, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And there's the, the talk now is for that index, Hirschhorn something index to be altered and lowered because of the impact, the driving impact of so few players in these key segments. But I wrote, like I noted earlier, I wrote a column about for the coming week about the Packer concentration. And I think it's gonna surprise a lot of people because it's bottom line is, I don't know how you break up the Packers. I don't know how you break up the big egg chemical or you know, seed companies. I just don't know how. There's so few of them left. If you do break them, what do you break them into? And how do you right. do it that, that they don't come back on you and you know, in, in in every court, you know, from from the Hague to, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the, the federal courts there. I just don't know how you do that. Um, in 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 in, in essence, what I'm saying, it's that's too late. That's to me, that's wasting a lot of time and a lot of money uh, in an effort that's going to end up in the Supreme Court anyway. And I don't I don't think we do breakups very well in this country. Uh, what instead I would promote is is uh, financing or protection, federal protection, for ancillary markets to grow up alongside. Shower government benefits that you've given all the packers, for instance, on smaller packers. You've given the big packers, how many communities compete hammer and tong with each other to give away a hundred million dollars worth of benefits, tax abatements for 10 years, streets, roads, water, land, zoning, air quality, they give those all things away to get 10,000 jobs, you know, important jobs. What if you just took that 100 million, divided it up in 50 different communities, gave every community $2 million, and they then use those to make the same concessions to a local packer. Give them some water, give them some tax abatements. Let the federal government waive the federal inspection fees for, you know. Uh, you in Minnesota have a, a, a program where if it passes state inspection, it's pretty much federal inspection. It should right. be that way nationally because federal meat inspection laws, every state that I know of, their state's meat inspection laws are exactly duplicate of the federal government's. <laughs> right. And so I, I don't know why you have two other than just, you know, more bureaucratic interference, perhaps. We can do all those things right now. And, and you can do it for pennies, nickels, compared to the billions it would cost to prosecute these people. When I wrote that column, um, I called an old buddy of mine 
40 years ago, he wrote a story. It's an example of what I mean. 40 years ago, he and his colleague at Successful Farming, where I was at, at the time, wrote right. a story and said, who will kill the pigs? Because at that point, already in 19, early 1980s, we were seeing packers move into the hog business. And their question was simple. They, they, did, they didn't know. They, they thought, boy, this industry is under change and it's going to bring massive change. We knew that 40 years ago. Why didn't we act then? 30 years ago, we saw the packers start concentrating ownership of, of, of hogs to guarantee quality and supply. We knew that 30 years ago. Why didn't we do it when the environmental quality was the key issue? 20 years ago, the Packers started buying each other. You know, Tyson bought IBP for $3.2 billion in 2000. We didn't act then. It's not like we didn't have signs and signals along the way that we needed to do this. We did nothing. That I think now building the fence is a little late. And you know, what you're going to do is keep the Packers on the outside. They're going to fight and you're going to lose. Right. Well, and of course, you were referring to our state equal to program. Right. Um, and there's a recent move afoot with that. I'm a, a beef farmer myself uh, to allow us with the state equal to to be able to sell across state lines. That was one of the restrictions. Um, not sure how far that's going to go. Um, well, it's, it'll be a key element, perhaps, if, if it can get done and be done in, in the right way. It'll be a key element for every, uh, mm -hmm. every, every beef uh, uh, grower or cow, cow calf person in, in 100 miles from North or South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin. Right. right. Uh, those of us in the middle of the state, maybe not so much, but. Uh... but that there's, those people on the fringe sending theirs over to North Dakota keeps, you know, keeps. Keeps those people out of your markets in the central part too. Well, that's true. I mean, this is all a collective effort. Yeah. So, yeah. Katie, any other questions ready to be asked here? Yeah, we have several. But on the while we're on antitrust, um, Connie Carlson is wondering if you have any thoughts on Amy Klobuchar's recent statements about antitrust. You know, I know Amy is somewhat of a, a saint, and I, you know, I appreciate every effort that she has done in the past and, and, and continues to do, but I don't see a success for this. I don't see how it gets through Congress to start with. I know she's got some help on the Ag Committee now with Cory Booker and Real Believers, but you have to still get it through the House Ag Committee, and um, I don't see how you do that. You know, they're there to protect the big, big operations. Amy's got her hands full. I don't, I, it's not a symbolic effort on her. I, I truly believe she'll fight like crazy for it. But it's, you know, it's a fight that's gonna be very, very hard. And, in, and you, you, I can't imagine even some democratic senators in the Senate backing it. it it's just gonna be a, a slog and she'll have to water it down to maybe it'll become still meaningful, but it's gonna be a really, Oh, tough effort. I admire her, her, her tenacity and her, and in her idealism. It's what's been needed. And maybe and a lot of times legislatures know that this is just something to get started. It might take three years, five years, 10 years, but this is where we start until we build momentum, until we, and I don't want to use the word educate, but till other people become more informed. I, I prefer that word because then they, they have the opportunity to to, to decide for themselves. And that's really, that's really the key to convincing someone. You give them enough information, you inform them, and then they on their own arrive at a conclusion. And that's really, I think, what Amy Klobuchar is trying to do here. And it's an important effort. Is there a place for growers or farmers to support Amy? Uh, well, you'd know better up there than me uh, in Minnesota, but I would, I would show up at her meetings for sure. And I would post stuff on her website for sure to encourage her and give her staff more input as to how this might work at the local level. If anything, uh, what they need, they, Amy's a smart attorney, she knows the law. What they need to know is how that law will work at the grassroots level. And if that, if her, her ideas need to be altered or added to, to really make them more attractive and widen her base among just not farmers, but consumers, among retailers, among wholesalers, you know, those groups are critical because they really, they really push the food in your state and they 
believe it or not, they are in touch with Congress and the senators all the time. I mean, constantly. I mean, these people find a regulation that has a comma misplaced, they complain. So, and, and farmers notoriously don't. I mean, they just roll with it and some, most of them complain about government, but they will never uh, write their congressperson or, or give them a telephone call. My wife yesterday called Senator Ron Johnson's office. I doubt that it was gonna uh, register much impact, but it made her feel better. <laughs> uh, yes, it can be deeply satisfying to unload onto that answering machine sometimes. Yeah. Uh, even or or a staffer. Uh, what else, Katie? All right. Um, there's a couple questions. I think I'm just going to squish together here um, to go off of this. But how can we, like the average citizen, best advocate for real regenerative farm and uh, ranch-based solutions against these, you know, false solutions? Um, I need to find that question again. Uh, against these false solutions, Tom Bilsack and the Obama administration are proposing, such as carbon banks or ethanol and other biofuels. Um, yeah, one of the, what can be done at our level? More, <laughs> yeah, well, one of the more discouraging things I have ever witnessed in in um, reporting on agriculture issues was when Minnesota townships had some of their their ability stripped from them to for local livestock zoning. Yep. And I know where that goes because I grew up in Illinois and I fought and fought like hell and we always lost. In Illinois, we have statewide livestock zoning. We have 16 people at, in Springfield that make that law and you might guess who they are. Uh, so anything gets approved in Illinois. Everything gets approved in Illinois. In Minnesota, that local township rule was critical and to make sure to ensure that you had a future in agriculture, that you had an opportunity to not have to compete against outside money, outside interest and, and outside power and lot, largely out of state power. Uh, when, when you see what's happened in the last 10 years because of that, you, you, it's a crying shame. That's where I only point that out because that's where the fight should have been. That's where the state still can re-empower these local communities. Because after all, I mean, it's no more a, a conservative principle. There, there is no more conservative principle than local control, right? Mm -hmm. So how is it that the local control was stripped from the local people by these conservatives? And, and, and running people out of business or, or for precluding their ability to make a living isn't a conservative principle at all. And, and I would start at that level. I mean, at the township level. I am, uh, we, we are often uh, ridiculed in Illinois uh, for having so much government. We have something like 8,600 different uh, government entities in Illinois. My tax bill in Illinois used to have 13 different taxing bodies I paid to, um, but it was about accountability. And, 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 and without local control, without local zoning, uh, you don't have any accountability. The state senators aren't going to, I mean, the U.S. senators aren't going to save you at that level. You have to go down and take names, run for office, and, 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 and tell people straight up, this is why, this is why it's needed. It, most people, incredibly, most people are really, really reasonable. And I can tell you for a fact, most people look at me when I, uh, you know, from a distance, they write stuff to me that you wouldn't send to your worst enemy. I'm always shocked at how people <laughs> who don't know me write me such terrible, terrible stuff. And then when they meet me, they go, well, wow, you, you sound, you, you're a reasonable person. I always was. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, not, you, you know, in person, it's really, really hard to be angry with someone who has facts and figures. And personally, who doesn't want to argue with you. I mean, it takes two to fight. So I'm not going to argue with you. I mean, you have your view, I have mine, and let's respect each other. But the more people show up, three people can show up at a township meeting and carry the day. That's where mm -hmm. I would start. That's where I have started. Yeah, and we, we are fortunate that many of our townships here, I live in a township that is, uh, does have its own governance. Mm -hmm. The township next to me does not. They don't, they haven't gotten together to elect a board. So they're under county control, but at least it's not state at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah, it's, it takes people getting involved, doesn't it? 
just it's simple it's it, it takes time i uh, when i moved back to illinois uh, we moved to my wife Catherine's hometown in 1984 i ran for the local library board because i went into the library to get a book and they didn't have a newspaper a library didn't get a daily newspaper so i ran for the library board it wasn't a big race there were four of us running and four openings so um i did i did get elected i got the lowest amount of votes though and uh <laughs> we changed that they still get daily newspapers to this day yep so you can have an effect you know start out small chew small but chew mm -hmm. yeah take a bite what else katie um, I think to wrap, maybe wrap up this topic is, do you see anybody on the national stage that is willing to be a voice for sustainable ag? Well, that's a good question. It's not that there aren't any, but um, I see a lot of, I see a lot of, a big rise of ancillary organizations um, that most people in agriculture would not recognize or even know about. A lot of foundation money pouring into green efforts that, are, that look small now, but they're doing important work. And like I noted earlier, we just moved to Madison. Catherine and I moved to Madison in May. I'm surprised at the number of institutes in Madison that support agriculture and different mm -hmm. efforts within agriculture research efforts like the Savannah Institute and others like that. Um, that are doing really important work that then uh, politicals can can grab onto. They they need. They need more uh, publicity, perhaps. If you're talking about Congress and that, I am forever hopeful, forever hopeful that the younger generation uh, now are much better informed and much better uh, uh, have a clearer path to leadership than before on issues such as this. I don't, I, I don't think there's, what, 85, 89% of even the Iowa farmers agree with the, the idea that climate change is impacting their, their growing. They don't admit that it's, it's, they think it's nature, it's not man-made, the bulk of them, but it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. So I, when, when you start seeing numbers like that, uh, you start seeing business change. And when business changes, then the Congress will come along and laws will change. And by that, I mean, was it three weeks ago, General Motors announced that in 2035, they're not going to build any cars with internal combustion engines. It's only 14 years from now. And I know that sounds like a long time if you're eight years old, but if you're like me, that's tomorrow. That is really tomorrow. Now, th now, what business do you not want to be in when that happens? Well, if you're in agriculture, one of the big businesses you do not want to be in is ethanol. That's right. growing corn. 43% of our corn crop goes to ethanol two years ago. Last year was much great less because the mileage driven by nationally was down. Uh, ethanol plants in Iowa alone produced 500 million less gallons last year. So the handwriting is on the wall. Lift your head and read it. And, 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 and you want to be ahead of this. If, uh, so when you, when you see the big ships start turning, you know, get get in front of them. I mean, they'll suck you under if you're not. And and that's where I would be, prefer to be. And that's where I would point to to legislation or legislators locally, even at the county level and at the national level. This is, you know, this is where we're going. On. I mean, don't take my word for it. Take General Motors' word for it. I would like to, if we could, take just a little diversion from politics and policy. Uh, and maybe dive a little bit into the arts. Uh, if, if we could do that, I think you know where I'm going, Alan, with this. Um, <clears throat> you quoted uh, Wendell Berry recently uh, from his 1995 book, Turn of the Crank, uh, and a quote about that uh, political democracy can endure only as the guardian of economic democracy a democratic government fails in failing to protect the integrity of ordinary lives and local communities. And we've been touching on that. And Mr. Berry said it back in 95. Well, even further back in 90, in uh, 77, he wrote The Unsettling of America, uh, which uh, in my opinion should be on every farmer and farmer advocate's desk. Uh, and I think he's a national treasure. 
I, I coming from an arts background myself is poetry, novels, short stories. But that idea that political democracy can endure only as a guardian of economic democracy. Um, what do you have to say about that? Well, like you noted, it was written in 1995, published in 1995. Mm -hmm. And the book, like you noted, was another turn of the crank. That's the, its topic. And it's five or six or seven essays that Wendell wrote uh, throughout the 90s. And it's very slim volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you know anything about Wendell Berry, uh, if you've read him, it's, it, he can be dense. So you have to take your time. You have to pick up his rhythm. And then sentences hit you like hammers because, well, I don't think he was fully formed and he had fully formed his agrarian view at that point, his agrarian politics at that point. Um, you can see it taken shape and he swings this hammer with sentences such as that where you know it's dead on. It's been proven to be correct. If you don't, if you don't protect or, or, or you don't use democracy to protect your political economy, you won't have a democracy. Right. And it's very clear to most farmers now, even the biggest of the bigs, that they don't have a free market. I mean, how many farmers, I bet you 95 out of 100 farmers, if you ask them a general question, is there free, is agriculture an entirely free market? I bet none of them would say that, that it, that it is, because they have to deal with anhydrous dealers, you know, who give the neighbor a better price than you if you if you've got 5,000 acres and and he's got 25,000 acres. You, you know it's not true with John Deere. You know it's not true with um, Pioneer Bear. You just know it isn't uh, a free market. There's no such thing. I mean, prove it to yourself. Go to their websites and find, show me one website that has a published price on it <laughs> to buy anhydrous. Huh? Right. You're just not gonna do it. So in fact, Illinois Farm Bureau called me way back in the 80s and said, we're going to do this, this new thing. We're going to put prices on the internet. And I go, are you kidding? <laughs> I, said, I can't wait. And, uh, and I said, I can't help you, but that's a hell of a story. I'm going to write it. Boy, that, they dropped the, they didn't even know that, you know, that that was a crazy bad idea for them, their own business. So Wendell Barry still now is fully formed, uh, agrarian and very angry. He's very, he's 85 or 86 years old. And um, I have the pleasure of corresponding with him every now and then. I got a letter from him about, oh, a month ago, two months ago. And I had written him a letter and I had, had encouraged him. He's working on this book that he just can't finish. Hmm. And um, uh, I encouraged him to keep on writing. And I said, I know you believe. And, uh, and you know, I believe, and that uh, we, we need to keep faith. Um, and then he wrote back in his letter, in his reply, and he said, well, the problem with keeping faith is that you can't do it. And then you end up grieving. And, you know, talk about ruining a guy's day. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Wendell's view of it. Uh, but I, like you, I, I think that Wendell was spot on He's, he's prescient, he's, he's a seer, and he's just a, just a national treasure. And we should just read Wendell Moore to find out where we're going, because mm -hmm. he's, he can see it clearly. 30 years ago, he wrote this. He says. Right. right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to run a campaign uh, to have him as the poet laureate at some point. I would love that. I was, Catherine and I were in the audience at the National Cathedral when he won his Lincoln Prize. Mm -hmm. And then we went to um, Kennedy Center and he gave his lecture at all, it, it all depends on love, I think it was called. And um, I got to tell you, he was, he was fish out of water in Washington. <laughs> he just <laughs> didn't like it at all. Funny, funny. Okay, Katie, we've got uh, a couple of minutes here. Uh, do you have a burning question there that just has to come out? Excellent. Okay, so Audra is wondering um, about the phrase ecological service markets. They say that that's a new buzzword that they're hearing and how can small scale producers capitalize on, you know, buzzwords like these or phrases? Um, 
I'll be honest with you. I don't have any idea of that concept. I've never heard it before. Is it that new? I cast Jerry, do, can you help me out here, please? Um, I haven't heard ecolo ecological service markets. Is that what the phrase is? Interesting. And, and it doesn't have anything to do with the um, uh, carbon sequestration credits thing. Uh, there's not much context to it, but I think like in okay. the context that I've heard it is probably, yeah, like ec ecological services that, I mean, farmers provide in terms of like clean water, clean air, um, carbon storage, oh, well, and that the, makes, that makes... ecological service. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how you price it unless you have an open market and we've seen, we've seen a lot of uh, pushback from farm groups that oppose it especially the American Farm Bureau Association. They just don't like market oriented uh, uh, markets. For instance, 2000, what? I can't remember, but the Obama administration had, it was gonna put a carbon market in place. They fought it. They fought it tooth and nail. And I can tell you how hard they fought it because my brother was leading the charge in Illinois mm -hmm. uh, against it. So uh, uh, maybe the, the time is right now I would really advocate that it not be for carbon though. I would, you know, if there are other benefits that you can get and maybe even through the EQIP program at the USDA, the Environmental Quality Improvement Program, you know, that's just a billion dollar a year program. There's another program you could spend two or three billion dollars a year on to clean up messes, not to make more. And, but we're spending half of that billion dollars a year to make more. And it was just insane that they think they can do that, uh, you know, continue to, to do that. Um, I would, I would happily, happily take that idea and expand it in the CRP. And instead of having 21 million acres in CRP, let's have 42 million acres. We know they're out there. We could have 60 million acres of CRP and that would be spent $10 billion a year on it. Call it ecological uh, quality improvement. I don't care what you do, but then that lifts corn prices, it lifts soybean prices, it makes more grass. It becomes the basis for a, a grass fed livestock uh, industry that would then promote more rural communities and stuff. I think spending five or $10 billion a year on the CRP or name it, whatever you want, a new program, whatever, would be just an incredibly wise investment at this point. And we also know that CRP long-term 20 years, 25 years does, does uh, uh, store carbon, you know, with grasses undisturbed. So, I mean, if you want, you want to start getting two and three and four birds with one stone. That's where I would start. And that's where you could start paying farmers to do it right and pay them to grow a crop that's really necessary, grass. Great. <laughs> For those who don't know, CRP is Conservation Reserve Program, which yeah. sets aside, used to call set aside. Uh, yeah, but that's it. USDA doesn't like anybody linking the idea of, of, of soil conservation programs with set asides. You know, we're not doing this to make to raise corn and soybean prices. Although that's exact genesis of the program back in 1985. It was yes, <laughs> uh, and and it would and and there are have if I'm understanding correctly, uh, there has been some loosening of the uh, rules about grazing on CRP land. Well, there's no reason you can't have grazing on CRP land. No reason whatsoever, other than we just didn't want people to benefit from it. Graze CRP, lower the payments twenty dollars an acre, so that you you know the grass value is twenty dollars. Give them the, the twenty dollars in kind. I don't understand. Give give those farmers who want to sign a long term CRP contract. And keep in mind, some of this CRP ground has been in CRP for forty years. Mm -hmm. Give those long term people a carbon benefit then. We can do that. I mean, scientifically, that makes sense. We can do this, but you know, there's not a lot of a lot of push coming from outside, and that's what it needs. Push. I mean, Congress seems more willing now to discuss these things. Can we get them passed? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but unless you try, we do know what the outcome of that. It won't happen. Right. Got to push back some anyway. All right, so we've got uh, just a couple of minutes here uh, and we do want to stop so that people can shuttle over to the other sessions starting at 11 o'clock. One more question, Katie. All right, this might be tough to answer in just a couple of minutes, but I think it's important based on what you just said. 
Um, Hannah is wondering if we can expect more capitalist markets to solve our problems. Well, I'm going to stay out of, uh, I don't know if it's Lenin or John Lennon or, you know, <laughs> the other one, um, Marxism, but, but the language is, you got to be careful, of course, but I, I see, I get your point. I think you're right about the larger point here. No, I, you know, I don't think, I don't think it'd be impossible to claim that agriculture is capitalism in its purest form. I mean, it's, it never was. It's, it isn't anywhere in the world. When I started uh, as an ag writer in 1981 in Cedar Falls, Iowa, of all places, um, we were told right, that that year, uh, farm program payments in 1981 were projected to be $1 billion. $1 billion, first time ever. And the, the uh, Europeans were going to spend $8 billion. And we were told that the European policy, the common agricultural policy of Europe cap could not be sustained. We were going to outproduce and bury the Europeans. Well, last year we spent 46 billion plus in direct payments. That doesn't include crop insurance, which is probably another 10 billion. And the Europeans probably spent north of a hundred billion. We're both spending like drunken sailors. <laughs> and we, and we haven't, done anything. We haven't accomplished anything really in, in the way of food quality or environmental quality or conservation. And at least the Europeans spent their, their money on food. We spent it on farms. And if there's one wave of the wand that I get for as a, you know, a mulligan, that would be it. Let's focus on, on food. Because when you do, you end up with something called Europe. You end up with bakeries and butcheries and, you know, cheese plants and local groceries, uh, just an entirely local food industry right there. Very specific people say, well, you know, that's interference in the marketplace. Ethanol isn't, <laughs> and uh, fructose isn't. We have a, a sugar policy that you in Minnesota are very aware of, mm -hmm. you know, entirely responsible for, I'd say, in many oh. regards, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's umbrella. Is, is, is fructose and sugar beet umbrella is, is the corn program. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing free about American agriculture. It is a, you know, a, a false flag to say it's a capitalist system at any stretch of the imagination. It's right. not. And if we could recognize that finally, we would make big changes. Well, at that, that's uh, I think a good place to pause this. Uh, folks, you can find Alan's website, uh, Food and Farm File, is that? Farm, farm and Food File. That farm kind. and Food File. And I highly recommend the book, The Land of Milk and Uncle Honey. It's a delightful read and insightful as well. Uh, so at this point, we're going to go ahead and end this session. Thank you all for being here. And thank you very much, Alan, for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Katie, for helping out. Glad to be Thank you so much. <laughs>